What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bronx Pinstripe Show. Three out of four, almost said two out of three. Not used to the four-game series, the, the Thursday through Sunday against the Red Sox. Final games against the Red Sox took three out of four. Almost a perfect weekend, if not for one very odd meltdown by Garrett Cole, which we'll talk about. Yeah. But a lot of positive things happened this weekend against the Red Sox. And we've got a little bit maybe clearer picture on what's going to ha- be the the seedings for, for the playoffs. Baltimore is just like, you know what, Yankees? You got this. You can take this. It's yours. Take it. (laughs) Whose bullpen can be worse down the stretch? It seems like the Baltimore Orioles are are taking that cake. I didn't think that was going to be possible, but my goodness, are they in – they're in some shambles over there. Yeah, really good series. The fact that the Yankees uh, took three of four was a very good thing because it could have been – you know, just like we always talk about, if you go into the final – the Monday and it's a four-game set and you drop that last game – splitting it in a four game set is very different and feels very different than taking three of four. And you're right. It could have been four of four, most likely if, uh, if we didn't have some, some weird antics by, uh, by our ACE, which don't make me feel great going into the, the next start and potentially game one start, uh, with his mentals. Um, I'm all about the mentals right now. I think that's a, it's a big, it's a big area of focus to, to identify where everybody's mentals are. And actually Ironically, I think the bullpen's mentals are maybe in a better state. That is interesting to talk about because one of the positives I wanted to discuss from the weekend was the bullpen. In general, 16 and two-thirds innings pitched to a 1.08 ERA, over 10 strikeouts per nine innings in the four games. And you saw Holmes come in in a couple big spots and get outs. Like, I know he didn't get the save in any of these games, but he pitched late in these games in high lever spots and he got big outs. He did, and uh, and that's it's one. It's you got to see that going into it. It's huge. the The fact that he can have some command, if he's able to 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 regain his command, we've been talking about this. This is probably the most talented guy in the bullpen. Still, no matter how many games he's he's blown or saves he's blown, he's still the most talented guy out there. And for the love of, uh, I just I just need him to throw that two seamer, that sinker, a little bit more. But he's he's working uh, effectively and. Yeah, maybe the ninth inning was just a thing with him. Maybe the mentals in the ninth inning for him well, were not great. That's not great. Logan, can you look up – I don't know where – what has this strike percentage by pitch. Do you know where that would be? Because I'm, I'm curious how – Is it a sub- baseball savant? Like, uh, Holmes' sinker, I agree, is clearly his best pitch. But when he was struggling, blowing all those saves, it was because he couldn't throw it for strikes. And so he would have to default to his sweeper as the get-me-over pitch – and I'm sorry, that's just not going to cut it if if you're just throwing spinning sweepers in the middle of the plate, belt high to guys. You're no. going to eventually get hurt. But when he executes that, that is it a slider? Do they call it a sweeper or is it a slider? I thought it was a slider. It's but a when, sweeper by by the by whatever. It's yeah. This is I've one of it. honestly. <laughs> it goes this one this one needs to go away. Not. This it, one needs to be so done. No, with the it literally. If you look the at the sweeper, season, needs it, to be uh, eliminated from terminology. There's a baseball slider and there's a curveball. Just designate them as one of those two, please. Like the for, <laughs> and it's almost like equal because they they split it like yeah. for, when we do so the if I was commissioner episode, I'm implementing the outlawing of the sweeper. You've got to classify it as a sink as a slider or a curveball. Yeah, throw the throw the two seamer and sinker in there too, if you if you wouldn't mind, please, for my sanity. But the um, when he's when when that pitch is good for him and he and he could throw it back door, it's it's a, an ex, extremely good complimentary. That's a secondary pitch. a secondary pitch. He yes. just rely, he's been relying on it too often and not throwing it for strikes. And uh, yes, it, it's a, it becomes a it can become a cement mixer. Well, you and can he tell. gets and he gets it hit when he comes into the game if he's leaving sinkers high and away to lefties or up and into righties. Like if it's just sailing away out of the zone on him, he's got, he doesn't have it. He doesn't yeah. have his command of that sinker. And then right. you know, what's coming next. It's okay. I'm going to go to the the sweeper to get strikes and it's <laughs> and not, gonna, just, it's not going to be good enough. Well that, and, and sometimes he leaves that, that pitch up and that's where, that's where you've seen like the, over the last month and a half, you I feel like you've seen more fly balls from him. Um, and it's because he leaves that, that pitch up in the zone. And I think people are looking for it because he can't throw the two seam or the sinker for a, for a strike. But anyway, not to, not to get on his, his, uh, his bad side of things. He, he was pitching well and you're right. Like you don't put him in the, in a, in a save situation. 
Um, obviously trying to work his confidence back up, trying to, they got to get him in situations uh, that are still relatively high leverage. I don't want him to be a guy that they're just throwing him, you know, low leverage situations. That's not, that's what not how he's going to be effective. He pitched the final two batters of the 10th inning on yep. Thursday. And then he came in, in yesterday's game and got two outs in a, in a three run game. I mean, it's not the highest of, of leverage, but it's a, it's a quote it's a, unquote it's a high enough situation. Leverage. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I know he did give up a hit, but I don't know. It's you're looking, you're, you're grasping at straws. You're grasping for things to find positives, especially when it comes to this Yankees bullpen. And everyone except Mark Leiter Jr. was good. Was good this weekend. Mark Leiter Jr. gave up another home run. I'm completely done with seeing that guy pitch. Like I, you can't trust him. I mean, literally, it feels like every single time he comes out there, there's a there's a there's a home run ball being served up. So no. You cannot have him pitch. And yes, everybody else. I tell you, the, the person who, who has been like the shining light um, is Tim Hill. Like this guy has come over and pitched. Crack mustache? The, the, yeah, the, 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 meth, the meth addict has come over from Chicago who released from the White Sox. Historically terrible team. Imagine being so bad the White Sox release you. Yeah, and you come over and, uh, you know, we mocked it, of course, because it deserved to be mocked at the moment. And literally, Brian Cashman was throwing shit against the wall to pray to God that the bullpen can get fixed by Not, one of these he will tell two you, of these guys. He will tell you that the, 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 the minions all found, they, they found the underlying metrics. They found the hidden gem in Tim Hill. They're like, um, Brian, well, we got one, but uh, released by <coughs> the, the White Sox. <laughs> Just, Brian's like, just, okay, okay, but show me, his, lefty? show me his picture. What does he look like? God <laughs> damn it, guys. <laughs> just make sure he keeps the mustache because if we're going to go ridiculous, let's just stay all the way in that zone. But no, he's been really good. And, and you know, the guy competes, man. He's, uh, he, throws, he shows some fire out there. And, and if, if nothing else, show me that fire. Show me that you care and I'll, I'll support you. But um, yeah, they, they've pissed well. And I got to say, Weaver... Weaver at the end of the bullpen, kind of like it. Two feel inning like save. Two feel inning. Like he's, feel like he's stepping up in a moment. Like he enjoys the, uh, you know, enjoys the pressure. Prefer, pre, pressure is a privilege for, for Mr. Weaver. Um, but yeah, he's stepping into that, into that quasi role a little bit more often than most. And I think he's doing it well. He got a six out save, struck out five batters on Friday. He Dominant. was lights out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do as far as who gets the save situations when it comes to be the playoffs. If they're going to just continue to do what they've been doing, matchup dependent, find lanes for guys and that kind of thing. I, I You know how I feel about that, especially when Aaron Boone is calling the shots and, and the pressure is ramped up in the playoffs. Like you've got to be on point with all of your decisions. One thing is can go wrong and that's the game. But then again, I don't know who you they would say. They don't have say. a choice. I, I, exactly. I don't know who you would say. I guess it's Weaver, maybe, Cousins. I don't know. Canely. Like, when Canely's pitching and I see his ERA, it's like 1.8. I'm like, how is it a 1.8 ERA? Because it feels like all he's doing is throwing changeup after changeup, and there's always two two runners on base every single inning. But he doesn't he doesn't give up any runs. But I'm just like, damn, this doesn't feel good, Tommy Canely. Yeah, but the, for uh, it's still one of the great mysteries of baseball to me is that how that man can come in and throw a changeup. Everybody knows you're going to throw a changeup, and it still is extremely effective. What are you changing up from? Uh, right, exactly. It's and and when he came in because Cousins was struggling, obviously couldn't find the zone. Canley came in and got the got the uh, ground ball for the double play to end the game. Um, you know, just exactly what he what he needed. In some in some moments, you need that ground ball so that you can get two outs and not looking for that, that strikeout. So look, I, they don't have a choice. They, they have to plug and play and match up and, and, and just, you know, understand the situation. What I do think that that does though, is it actually, it, it does make the bullpen better, I believe, because then you have, you're throwing out the closer piece. So now you're just essentially trying to lock down one, one inning at a time. And if it's Boone throwing more guys out there, uh, like the decisions that he's being made or that he's making at that point, could they go wrong? Yes. But, but again, there's, there's no real right decision. That's exactly. the point. <laughs> You're kind so of I, just, even when he brings someone in, in the playoffs, it's going to be really difficult for us to shit on him. Uh, unless it's Mark Leiter. Unless, unless it's Mark Leiter and he gives up a home run, which he will. Um, but 
there's just not a a true for, right I answer. Guess you're right. For his sake, that's the best actually position to be in as a manager managing a bullpen. It's like I have no right options. I have no wrong options. It's it, you're kind of rolling the dice every single time you bring them yeah. in, and you hope that they're on their game that night. And, is that and, is that is that sustainable for for a D- DS Championship Series and World Series? Likely not. But hey, you never know. You never know. You never know. And when you have um, a guy like Clay Holmes, if he can catch fire with his accuracy, which but he's then, done it in but the But past, if he catches fire, is he then the closer again? Like, that's the decision that'll be interesting to see what they make. Do they re-anoint him the closer? No, I don't think you re-anoint anybody a closer. I think at that point, you just have a very, very effective person who can come in, whether it's the 7th, 8th, ninth, and and go up against tough right-handed bats that are that are in the lineup well, if he's able to take, throw strikes it's gonna take and that's a, a good thing of... but you're showing you're showing now guys have shown that they've been able to come in in the ninth inning yep. and close out games you've seen so, it from cousins you've seen it from weaver on a couple of occasions it's going to take a lot Kingley. of restraint though from boone and the coaching staff to when holmes eventually gets a save opportunity and if he succeeds and looks good it's going to be hard for them to have restraint to not be like okay he's the closer again I, I don't think so. I think that they just realize that, that their their bullpen is a, a a bag of tricks and they have to pull out these bag of tricks in different in different times. Right. And they're now, not now even they're sure magicians. if the tricks are gonna win. <laughs> yeah, now yeah. Let me get well, if you had to guess, what percentage does Canely throw his change up this season? I'm looking at the numbers right now. You're looking at the numbers? Mm-hmm. Oh man. Um eighty five percent. It's seventy three percent. Okay, I was originally going to say 80 and then I was like I'm going to go drastic. But if but you if you throw a, a pitch 73% of the time, the hitter should not be sitting on anything except that pitch. I know. I don't get it. 20% fastballs, 5% slider. Apparently he throws a sinker. 1.4%? Yeah, I mean it probably looks like his fastball or his changeup coming out of his his hand and does the same thing just a little bit faster. Logan, where are you? I mean, it's, f- it's obviously a good pitch. It's obviously difficult to to square up. It's obviously difficult to get, uh, you know, to, to to actually square that thing up and not get not hit it on the ground and not just beat it into the dirt. So yeah, it's a good changeup. It's just it. I know. So I remember when Keith Folk was dominating the Yankees in the 2004 playoffs by only throwing changeups. I was screaming at the TV like, "Sit on the changeup!" <laughs> yeah, like, hey guys. It's going to be an 85 mile an hour changeup. It's not going to be his 90 mile an hour fastball. It's going to be his 85 mile an hour changeup. 85 mile an hour changeup, swing through. 85 mile an hour changeup, swing and miss. I'm like, what? Just sit on it. Power changeup. It's a power changeup. Like, um, who was that reliever for the Yankees? The skinny guy who had the the power changeup? Edouard Ramirez. Edouard Ramirez? Edouard Ramirez or something like that. Edouard, yeah, yeah. And. Canely, I mean, that goes like, you know, it's how the Yankees do the throw, you know, just throw your best pitch. I mean, his his change of this yeah. year, batteries have hit 144, his expected batting average, 163. Like, they don't square it yeah, up. Yeah, great. I mean, look, it's a fastball hitting league, so he's he's found he's found the magic With potion on 40%. how to, uh, mm-hmm. to, to serve these these guys who, uh, who obviously can't hit something that's low in the zone and not fast. It's not quite as bad, but it's like going up there against Mariano Rivera and, and his, not sitting on cutter. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking it, but I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> because even when... Even when you're, even when you're, it's a fastball and it cuts in on your hands. I'm kidding. It's just very difficult. It was a joke, guys. It was a joke. Mm -hmm. Uh, Canely's fastball, like batters hit it. Like still, as even though he only throws it 20% of the time. Why doesn't throw it? 296. He basically basically throws it once an at bat. His velocity's down. I'll I'll say another thing. Uh, It's usually not a strike. You know, we were talking about this like three three weeks ago and how the everything is going to look different. The team is going to look different. The team looks totally different than it did a month ago. Completely the bullpen, different. But it's the same names in the bullpen. No, it's not. You have Ian Hamilton out there now. You have um, yeah, for the most part, a couple other guys coming back. The guys all we the all the guys we just mentioned. Tonkin's gone. All the guys we just mentioned for competing for the high leverage spots: Canley, Holmes, Weaver, Hill, Cousins. All of those guys were there a month ago. They all you have, stunk a month ago, but they were all there a month ago. But you have additional arms in there down too. Yes. And Brubaker Hamilton. also, I just saw was coming back. I guess he's starting a rehab. I have no idea oh, what Brubaker. to do. What, what's that? What that's Brubaker. Brubaker. <laughs> yeah, Brubaker. Are you kidding me? 
Brew Baker's going to come back. F. Ross, you know what? Who the hell knows? Maybe F. Ross just is like gone after that after that one home run that he gave up. I think he's done. We uh, we just said, hey, there's no wrong decisions Aaron Boone can make in the bullpen because it's all crapshoot. If Brew Baker comes in at a big spot and he fails, I'm going to get on Boone for that one. Give me Brew Baker, okay? It's it's straight out of a movie. But no, also, what's going to happen in the playoffs? Again, still going to look even different because most likely Nestor and and now we've. Uh, We've seen that Strowman was uh, available out. That's that's probably the se- the next guy that's going to be out there and available. Mm-hmm. All right, the last positive from not the last positive, but the other positive we want to talk about. Judge finally broke his homerless streak, and it was with a grand slam to give the Yankees the win, the comeback on Friday. That was awesome. He, line drive to left field, just pummeled it. I, listen, I wasn't like, oh, I'm worried now here, Judge, he sucks again. But it had been a while since he hit a home run. And it was becoming a thing. That's the thing. It was becoming a thing. Look, I after what happened in April and then what we saw what happened this season, I'm no, no longer ever going to be concerned about Aaron Judge until the father time conversations start coming into play. And that's, I believe, many we still have many years from now for that conversation to happen. I did not see that live. I was at a Bruce Springsteen concert, um, having a fantastic time. Uh, and my brother and I were actually, uh, following it and saw that the, the, the grand slam. So I ended up watching it with, with Kemp, um, the next day so that we could see the whole thing, but it was awesome. It was a great moment. Obviously, um, he smoked the ball. The place was going nuts. It was a, it was a perfect moment for, for it to happen. It was an absolutely perfect moment. And the fact that it was against the Red Sox, um, yeah, it was a, it was a it was a huge home run. So we put out that clip of us talking about how Judge needs to have a good October. Remember we yep. talked about that a couple episodes ago. Yes. And I, and I don't I don't read a lot of social media comments anymore, but I saw it had a few comments on Instagram, so I was reading through them, and they were like, "Oh, these these idiots all crushing crushing Judge because he's in a slump right now." I, were we crushing Judge in that clip, or were we just saying that he needs to have a good October because he's never had a good October? Like that was the point we were making. Yeah, he just needs to step up in in the in the playoffs, which which I have full confidence for. I don't ever crush Aaron Drudge, you know, but he's uh, he's a guy that is the captain. We're in the sea now, and the Yankees have obviously not come through in in playoff moments with him on the team. He's got to do it. He's got to exercise the demons. Got to exercise the demons. And it's not like he's been a complete no show in the playoffs because he does have a decent number of home runs. And I think his OPS we talked about was seven seventy or something like that's not that's not unplayably bad or anything like that. It's just far below what he normally is in your lineup, which is yeah. the best hitter in baseball. And so listen, does he need to have a thousand OPS in the playoffs? Like that's kinda gonna be hard to do. But you gotta come up be a nice. little bit gotta sure. You gotta come up <laughs> a little bit more than he has been in his playoff script. Now, to his defense, I think there was some, some, uh, some spot like some past lineups, especially. I know they weren't in the playoffs last year, but was it twenty twenty two when they were like? They think about that twenty twenty two. There uh, was just no support. This, no this support is the best lineup he's lineup. been in, in, a, in since like what seventeen maybe? No, probably like, since nineteen. Nineteen. The. Uh, I 19, think this, no that nineteen lineup, especially when they got a little bit healthier in the playoffs. Was very good. I think this lineup has the, as much potential as any lineup we've seen in a very I'm long time. I'm not disagreeing with that, but yeah. to call the 19 lineup not supportive is wrong. No, no, I'm saying I'm comparing to to yeah. what we see today. I mean, right. you know what? That's on Aaron Boone, though. Hit in that 2019 lineup in the playoffs. So, I mean, maybe, well, but yeah, it's different. That, that was, was stupid. I, I agree. Was, that was stupid, know. but. Read the rest of the lineup. So I mean, DJ well. Lemay, DJ Lemay, he was hitting leadoff, and that was when DJ Lemay, he was one of the best hitters in the league. Judge was hitting second. Then, yeah, Brett Gardner third. I'm guessing who was fourth? Stanton, I know he pulled himself from that series. So it was Stanton. There was probably uh, Edwin Encarnacion <laughs> so was on mm. that team. You know, maybe I'm rethinking Clay, my. Clay was in the top my maybe lineup. I'm rethinking. This is everything. the most talented lineup he's had since 17, I think. But 17, uh, a freaking Ellsbury hit in the middle of that lineup in the wild. Yeah, card but game. 17, they were hitting like we we saw. There were there were all you had the Gary people. Sanchez still actually Gary Sanchez yes, mashing. and Didi yes. was good. Oh, Didi was in the that 19 lineup. No, Didi hit ninth. Yeah, he hit ninth. 
Yeah, in 2019, I'm looking at game one of the ALCS. Edwin hit, Glaber hits third, Edwin hit fourth, That's not Stanton hit fifth, Gardner okay. hit sixth, you, Sanchez, <laughs> Ishella, Didi. This is much, much <laughs> deeper, a much deeper lineup. You read those names, and I, deeper. My, my reaction when you re- read those names in that order was, ugh. Yeah. Not good. You put Juan Soto in any of those lineups, and it's and it's, well, uh, it's, it's that much better. Well, I mean, Juan- yeah, duh. <laughs> that's, okay, that's, hear me out. Hear me that's out. That's a big deal. Hear me out. So you're gonna put you're gonna put Babe Ruth in the lineup, and it's gonna be better. But you just said 2019 was was better. I I, I didn't say it was better this, one this has, year. <laughs> this one has Juan Soto. I right. said 2019 was also supportive around Judge, and yeah. then reading the names in that lineup, not so much. It's not as good as I remembered. This one now won't. And what, what we're seeing, go what ahead, Logan. Say? Hicks got in there too. Don't forget. Didn't he have a? He had a. Hicks he had a big in. home run off. Hicks early. got in there by the end of the series too. Yeah. When Stanton, the huge home run off. The, later, the yeah. thing too now is as series, what we're think we're obviously looking at how how's the team going into first the Baltimore series. Let's just let's let's finish what we need to finish for for this division. Take the division so that that Orioles series doesn't really matter because they've been reeling obviously. But like, how are guys hitting? Rizzo has been better since coming back. The um, you're you're starting to see Judge now pick it back up. I think the last thing that we really need to see is 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 Soto starting to hit a stride, and if he's coming into the playoffs hot, and you see both of those guys um, doing it, the Yankees are going to be the Yankees are going to be very tough. They're going to be very tough. And Logan, look, Gl- Glaber, I need you to admit this soon. Soon, I'm waiting another week just for the thing to. Just to get the sample size even even a little higher, but the the dude has been very very good in we're gonna talk the about leadoff Glaber. spot. Don't you in worry. the leadoff spot? We're gonna talk about Glaber. Logan, can you look up Soto's <laughs> career playoff numbers uh, for for us? But first, the playoffs are right around the corner. You might want to go to one of those games. Why wouldn't you? Game time is the best place to find tickets to playoff games this October because game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, meaning buying tickets to a game on game time is faster and easier than ever. The app has so many great features. I love the flash deals so you can see what sections the best deals are in. That also might be cool if you're just looking for last minute playoff tickets. You just want to get in the door. Click on that flash deals. You can also toggle the all-in pricing so you can see what the final price is going to be. You're not going to be hit with surprise fees at checkout. Seat views. You can get real pictures from inside the stadium so you know what you're going to get. The app is streamlined. is easy to use. Just a few taps and your purchase is done. The app allows for easy sharing of tickets with other people as well if you're going to the game with friends and family. Game Time has great tickets for concerts, comedy shows, theater, and much more in addition to baseball games. And the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less money, Game Time is going to credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code BRONX for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Once again, create an account and redeem code BRONX for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Yeah. So I got his numbers here. Um, he's a 261 hitter with an 845 OPS. Uh, he was really, like, significantly better in 2019 on that World Series run with the Nationals than he okay. was on that <clears throat> NLCS run with the Padres. Definitely smaller ago. sample size, 845 uh, OPS. I mean, so here's the thing. Not we just talked about how Judge has a good. 770 OPS and 845. Like, it's not that much higher, but but it's like a – Smaller sample size, but if if Judge was an Smaller 845, 855 OPS hitter in the playoffs, no one would be talking about him having bad playoff runs because that means you're getting more walks. You're just getting on base a little bit more. It's just like a few more. The, the playoffs are kind of unfair in that sense to, to, to hitters because the sample size is always going to be small unless you're Derek Jeter and Bernie Williams and you literally play a season's worth of, of games in the playoffs. So it's really just about a couple of at bats that tweak the narrative. And the offense was was so heavily dependent on Aaron Judge doing everything in the right. past, whereas now he does not need to be that guy. Like, yes, he needs to be obviously productive, and he's a he's the 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 biggest part of that lineup. But when you have the names that are around him, and honestly, man, like you go back to the trade deadline, and we will shit on Cashman for all of the non-pitching moves that were not made or the pitching moves that were not made or the, the pitching moves that were made with, uh, with, with the, the, I think that lighter was a, adopted is what I'm getting to. Cause he does not have the pedigree. Okay. He does not have the pedigree, but um, 
Jazz Chisholm has been such a massive part of this second half run, and he's been so good with the Yankees. And the fact that he does bring that support behind Judge, behind Stanton, and he brings the athleticism that he does, it's a we got to give him credit for that because that was a that was a big move. And I was one that I was looking at the numbers because I hadn't seen Jazz play all that much, and I was like, eh, like is this guy really going to help the team? Hell yeah, he's helped the team, and he's been such a talk about the mentals. Like that dude was built to play here, and I'm really excited to keep, continue to watch him uh, be on this team. But I think he's 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 going to be a really uh, he's going to be a problem in the playoffs. I could see him being a real problem. Well, they needed athleticism, especially in the infield. yeah they did. And you, the, the team in general needs athleticism, needed more athleticism, and that Jazz is just such an athletic player. Right. And the fact that he's just, uh, you know, said, okay, I'm going to go play third base and just yeah. uh, and play it really didn't, well. And Didn't demand that he's a second baseman like <laughs> someone else. Well, you know what? At least, at least the, that person understands where their limitations are, you know, in, in an area. So for him, that's, that's probably just a very headsy comment. Oh, yeah. Honest. Yeah. The, I gotta give him a lot of no. credit. I gotta give him a lot of credit for understanding that you know, as a team guy, I have to tell you that I'm going to be really bad somewhere else. This is where I need to play. If that was a self awareness thing, then sure, I give Glaber credit for self awareness. But something tells me that was more about selfishness than self awareness, or fear, <laughs> or fear for going over there and trying to play third base. Well, the yeah. attempt at him playing and, to third base would not be good. And you know what? We all would have been afraid for him and yes. afraid for, for the Yankees in general. All right. Yes. Before we get to some negatives from the series, we know that bills can pile up and unexpected expenses can hit you when you least need them. One service you should not be overpaying for is your wireless provider. That's why I'm happy Mint Mobile is sponsoring today's podcast. Say bye-bye to overpriced wireless plans and hello to Mint Mobile for just 15 bucks per month when you purchase a three-month plan. And when they say $15 a month, they mean it. What you see is what you get. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any mobile plan. You bring your phone number and all your contacts along with you. It's a great offer that I know you will love because I have used it in the past and I also have friends that have used it in the past and they love it. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just $15 a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Bronx. Again, that is mintmobile.com slash Bronx. Cut your wireless bill to just $15 per month at mintmobile.com slash Bronx. $45 upfront payment is required, equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on a first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabyte on a limited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Garrett Cole, that was one of the weirder meltdown situations I, I've seen not just Cole have any any pitcher have so I'm at the uh the playground with Harrison on Saturday afternoon I've got one of my Raycon earbuds in okay Raycon's not sponsoring today but a little free, free promo for Raycon it's nice because they they split they're not wired so I got one of them in I'm pushing them on the swing and I'm just listening and I hear Susan say Garrett just held up the four fingers and I'm like, wait, there, isn't there no one? Isn't it the fourth inning? There's no one on base. What is going on? He's walking Devers here. And immediately, Susan and I think it was Emmanuel Barbari are like, hey, they don't want, they want no part of Devers. Okay, this is their plan. Here we go. And Garrett Cole proceeds to walk the next hitter, to give up a ground rule double, and to give up a base hit. He gets out of that inning, comes out, and gets completely destroyed the next inning. He ends up giving up seven runs in, in less than five innings. And it was such a quick turnaround up until that point in the game when Devers is up. The Yankees have was a one nothing lead at that point. He hadn't allowed, he hadn't allowed a base runner. I was going to say he was giving he was pitching a no hitter at that point. He hadn't allowed anything, and he decides to walk Devers there. And I know in the past we've talked about how Devers owns Cole, owns the Yankees. You do not let Devers beat you. I think it's implied that we're talking about seventh, eighth inning on, not fourth inning of a of a one nothing game you're leading when you haven't allowed a base runner even if you give up a solo home run there just move on and and and, and keep pitching to the next guy it's a one run game it's a 1-1 one, one game in the, in the fourth inning but the fact that he walked him and i know this was like a decision they talked about after the game Boone's like yeah Garrett and i we talked about this this is our plan this is something we can do if 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 Devers comes up to not let him beat us okay i don't love that but don't implode after you do that. It was just so, bizarre all around. So he hadn't given up a hit, but he did He did have a runner because he hit Devers in his first at-bat. 
And that was what Cora, because if you, after the game, there was a whole thing with Cora saying, well, now I know that he did that intentionally. It was, he spun a, a, a look like a, a slider or something into his, into right into his ass. And it was, um, so Cora was, you know, barking up a train. This is what Cora does. He just gets people fired up and sure. says like the world's against us. Obviously he did that intentionally. Um, and then, uh, put, put him on, but even the way that he did it, he went four and then did like a little slide over to first base. Like his arm, it was just, yeah, it was just weird. The whole thing was just weird. And when you, when you look at, uh, the fact that he was pitching really well and that he put him on and even said after the game, he was, he was on board with the plan. Who came up with that plan? Why are we talking about walking Rafael Devers? I understand that he's a, he's been a, a a significant problem for the Yankees. It's not just Garrett Cole. It's been the Yankees. He's been a significant problem basically his entire career. The guy destroys the Yankees. Okay. It's the fourth inning. There are no there's nobody on base. One out. Nobody on base. One out. It's a you're winning one nothing. It's the fourth inning, people. It's you're the scared fourth to death. inning. That he's going to hit a solo home exactly. run? Is that what we're talking about? Exactly. So you're that's saying the it's, fear? it's one to one in the fourth inning and, and that's an unwinnable game spot for you? Like, I what? cannot. Back to the mentals. I cannot have Garrett Cole in this mindset ever. Ever. Well, I luckily have, he's not going to face Rafael Devers in the playoffs. I don't but the care fact who that he's, he's like facing. But afraid? the fact that he... He got there. He got yeah. there in his head. And, and, and someone proposed this plan to Garrett Cole. Like, Garrett... Just walk him. You know, whenever he comes up, given the situation, maybe they walk through different scenarios. If this was a scenario where there was nobody on base and it was in the middle of the innings and you're pitching really well, then, you know, that guy needs to be fired. But the fact that this was a, a game plan and the fact that he was like, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm Garrett Cole and I, I support this plan. This is a good idea. No, you need to reject that plan immediately. That's the what, what I expect from him is to reject that plan and say, Absolutely not. I'm not, just, I'm not allowing someone to be knowing, knowing. I'm going to tell the world that this guy lives rent-free in my head. Oh, yeah. And he's going to get a free pass because I can't handle the pressure of pitching to this one person, even in a low-leverage situation. It's crazy. And that's what almost bothers me more than the decision, which is asinine. It's after that, walk to Tyler O'Neill, ground rule double to Yoshida, single to uh, Weiler Abreu. He gets out of that inning. He comes out the next inning. Trevor Story, single. Trevor Story, uh, Trevor Story uh, steals second base. Then he gives up a flyout. Then he then he hits Jaron Durand. Then he gives up a single to Rafael Devers. Then he hits Tyler O'Neill. <laughs> then he gives up a single to Yoshida. It's like it was. It spiraled it, fast. It was complete spiral down the toilet in an instant. And and when you see that he. Mentally couldn't rebound from that one. Right. He knew a he decision knew, he made, a decision that he made. And even when he did the the whole weird like going to, it's almost like in jest. Like, yeah, I am actually doing that. Send him to first base. Like, this is me throwing up four fingers and actually sending him to that's first base. That's throwing up the I'm white flag. Doing that's it. not throwing up four fingers. That's throwing up the white flag. And I, I think at that in that moment, it 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 beat him down because he was defeated and he couldn't bounce back from it. Not good. You not you want to pitch good. around Devers? Fine. Throw him four sliders in the dirt. I don't care. But mentally, that's different than intentionally walking a guy in the fourth inning. 1,000%. There's nobody on base. Exactly like you just said. Throw it in the dirt. Throw it to the screen. I don't give a shit. Do what you – just. but don't do what you did. Don't do what you did. Because now I'm looking at that and I'm thinking about it. I'm like, all right, well, now we have a big pressure situation of a guy who's hot – uh, in the playoffs, and what are we going to do here? Are we are we thinking that we can beat him? Because I really need you to believe that you can throw that ball past anybody on the planet. Yeah. That's what I need. Could you imagine if Roger Clemens ever walked a guy like like in the in in any situation? First of all, but like in or or, or even Andy Pettit or like any but any any. No, I mean, High it's not, it's not any situation. Pitcher. No, if, if Rafael Devers comes up in a one run game in the eighth inning. And you want to intentionally walk him? Okay, fine. The fourth that's, that means the go ahead run is at the plate at that point, right? No, the, no. What I'm <laughs> no, but we've that no. I'm okay with that. If you want I'm to pitch not. around Devers in the eighth inning, fine. Not in the fourth inning. Even in the eighth inning, when there's nobody on and there's one out and you're up one nothing, I'm not putting have, a time run on base. Haven't we seen teams do that with Judge this year? <laughs> 
Rafael Devers is not Aaron Judge against the Yankees. He is uh, not, and not, and not when Garrett Cole sh- is pitching and where where that mindset should be. No, the mindset is the problem here. The mindset is the problem. That's a big problem mentally. That's a problem, and I and I just need him to get past that. But yeah, yeah, the confidence level. But but with him understanding that situation, it's just it's it's. It's a defeatist attitude, and he just he needs to be the complete opposite of that. He needs to th- no, walk out there knowing that he's going to dominate everybody. And the pitching was good all weekend, except him. He got crushed. He melted down. It's it's really I don't know. I mean, we, we an under underrated I don't know whatever the word is aspect to how the Yankees going to fare in the playoffs. Well, that all might go out the window. Game one when Garrett Cole's on the mound. What if he's not good? Like it's. Yeah, well, we're not going to go down that path. He's going to be good, uh, but he needs to get past this. This needs to never happen. You say again. he's going to be good, but like he's had a he's had an injury. He was injured for the season. He's been on weird ninety pitch limit for the other half yeah. of the season, and then he, we've seen. I mean, this is just a really weird mental situation that I, I just found one of the more bizarre meltdowns I've ever seen. All right, the second negative is... Common sense department, check. Can we get a... Hit the button. Hit the button for the common sense department while they're having this. Someone in that room who was listening to that conversation could have hit that button. Oh, also, uh, last thing on this. So, yeah, they after the game, they talked about how Boone and, and Cole discussed it, but they didn't include Wells in that conversation. Wells was not aware this was a possibility in the game plan. <laughs> yeah. Your so catcher. Your catcher. Half the, ba- half the battery. Yeah. All right, so Glaber, we're another bizarre play on Friday was a ground ball. Schmidt was pitching. This is, I think it was the sixth inning. He had been really, really good. Ground ball to the first base, second base hole. It's a good ways off of first base. So Rizzo and any first baseman is never going to go for that ball because if Rizzo fields it, there's it's clearly a base hit because no one is going to be able to cover the bag at that point. So Pitcher. Rizzo. No, it, it it was it was a situation where this is not something this is not a, a ball that the pitcher is gonna be able to get over there on. Um because it's like a it's like a regular chopper to the to the second base hole. This isn't like a dribbler, this is like a ground ball to the first base, second base hole. Glaber just stands there flat footed, just like looks looks over at, at Rizzo like what happened? Like you're not gonna get that ball. Oh, that's me. That's that's my ball. And then Schmidt throws his arms up, like, what are you doing here? Two batters later, he gives up a two-run home run to Yoshida after almost giving up a two-run home run to O'Neill. It's one of these plays that I, I sit there, I'm looking at Glaber Torres, I'm like, what were you thinking about in that moment? Because it was not baseball. It was not I'm playing second base for the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium. Well, he plays he, second base. That was closer to first base. So he was like, mm. but it's 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 only a moment like he goes through these moments and we always say like how does he mess up these easy plays and i and i legitimately think he's mentally somewhere else thinking about something else i don't know what he's thinking about you have these moments right you'll be you'll be sitting doing something but you're not really mentally there and you're and and seconds go by and you're like oh i forgot i was doing this every time i'm reading a book <laughs> okay every time you're reading a book <laughs> or some, read? sometimes you're you're driving right you're driving and just like you're 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 in a moving vehicle going 65 miles an hour miles i got, I got in a lot of trouble talking about uh the, the fact that i had a yankee game on at one point so that's that's not me anymore I'm miles will go by on the I highway locked locked in okay you're locked every in. single time i wish i could say that my i'll go seven miles and i'll be like i did i just time travel what was it what what was happening for the last 10 minutes of my life because my, mentally i was not thinking about driving a vehicle i was doing something else mentally and that's what glaber torres i think is doing in certain spots and that's the only ex- explanation for him just standing there flat-footed as a ground ball which is clearly his ball just goes into the outfield there there is an element of daydream there and i think i think you're not that far off here i do think that he he gets into these zones of thinking about maybe another play or something else, and he's just like reliving it in his head. And the reality that's happening in front of him sometimes gets uh, gets put secondary, and that's that's an issue. Um, so an I don't issue, know to say the least. Yeah, and again, you know, maybe it was closer to first base, and he's like, "That's not my area. Uh, I'm I'm better over here." I've told people that, and I don't know why anybody's not listening to me. Rizzo, that's your ball, obviously. You know, like, well, so Schmidt I, clearly was frustrated with his second baseman for not going after the ground ball to second base. Yeah, 
So Clark Schmidt, um, I was at the Springsteen concert, obviously I, I, for, for Friday night. And I was, uh, I watched, rewatched the game, but in the moment when you're seeing Clark Schmidt pitch, I know he gave up that two run home run, but I thought he was very really good, good. from what very I good. saw, really good commanded his pitches. Um, and I think that like, as of now, you're looking at what's happening and obviously Stroman Boone already announced that, that he was available in the, uh, in the bullpen. And he did say that he could be reinserted into the starting uh, rotation, but it's, it feels like already what's happening here is, is kind of what we were predicting is that Nest, two of these guys are, are going to be in the bullpen for playoff time. Right. And Nestor is the one that's probably the, is definitely the more trusted higher leverage type guy. And then uh, Marcus Stroman is a guy that can give you innings could, you know, if there's a, 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 a blow up, a, you know, if there is an outing that um, a starting pitcher does not go deep, like he's a guy that would be maybe the first call in um, to keep uh, to keep the Yankees in the game and give them give them depth. But it does seem like those two guys are going to be available out of the bullpen, and they're kind of like testing the waters at this point. And Stroman came out saying, like, this is no problem. Like, um, whatever whatever the team needs, which is exactly what you'd expect from him. So, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, I agree with everything you just said. I hope once they make the decision, just stick to it and don't get funky. Like, don't try and do openers. Don't try and do piggybacks. Just let the starting pitchers go out there and start a game. Put the put the guys in the starting pitchers in the bullpen and say, your role for the next month is to be a reliever. So prepare for every game like you're a relief pitcher. And just go with that. Like, keep it simple, stupid. Don't try and get tricky. And be like, well, matchup, say we're going to get a lane for, for Ian Hamilton in the first inning on this. And then we're going to piggyback with Clark Schmidt. It's like, God damn it, guys. No, please. Just be just be normal. <laughs> yeah, be normal. Uh, and that's the thing. The preparation for these guys is not normal either. So I think giving them some some understanding of what their role is going to be and and you know being deliberate with that type of role is going to help them out as well. Being granted, I think Nestor can do anything in any in any position. I think I don't think anything phases him is what more more the the point. But um, I would they're going to have to get into some type of routine that's different than what they're used to. So I think having them in a situation that's a little bit that's understood and where the type of situation you're going to come in is important. Right. And Ian Hamilton, by the way, been good come, since coming back. He's looked yeah, good. Fine. I don't want him pitching the first inning of game three of the division series against Baltimore because they like the lane though. No, he might be the closer. <laughs> All right. The last negative from the series, just a head scratching decision by Volpe when he was up on Friday in the third inning, Rizzo was on second base. I think he got a double two outs and Volpe's trying to bunt for a base hit. He doesn't bunt for the base hit. He he hits the ball foul, and then he flies out to right field to end the inning. And I just, I'm like, even if you lay down the perfect bunt and you reach first base, all you're doing is passing the baton to the next guy who also needs a base hit. Just go up there, Anthony, and focus on swinging at good pitches. Just Just focus on that one thing. That's all I need you to do. Because right now, to this season... Your OPS is now 666. His it's, a career... tick le- it's a tick less than, than when you called that out, actually. Okay, fine. 665. His career OPS is 666. We're now 1,250 plate appearances into his major league career, and it's been very consistently 666 OPS. That's not a good offensive player, okay? I'm not saying he sucks. I'm not saying he's the worst player ever. We've seen flashes. <laughs> But because Verdugo takes that 666 crown. is not good offensively, especially from your top prospect who rose through your system primarily from his offense. And what I've seen with Volpe is weird things like that, where it's like, I'm going to try and bunt for a base hit with two outs, even though that makes no goddamn sense in the third inning of a baseball game, just like it makes no goddamn sense to walk a guy in the fourth inning of a baseball game intentionally. He swung at almost half the pitches he's seen this season. He needs to go up to the plate and just concentrate on being pitch selective and swinging at good pitches. Don't worry about bunting for base hits. Don't worry about any of that. Just focus on swinging at good pitches. Look, I, I don't disagree. I think that's that's uh, the number one, the number one part of his game that he just needs to go out there and do. Keep it simple, uh, and and yeah, have a good eye. Just like identify pitches earlier, identify. And obviously it's a problem. It's not like he's not trying to do that. I think he's having a difficult time doing that right now, clearly. So the, you know, that's, that's, that's easier said than done. Him bunting, it doesn't make sense. It's, it just looks like a guy that 
you know, has been striking out a ton, uh, is, is, is reeling again and is trying to do something positive to, um, you know, to get, to pass the baton because clearly there's a confidence issue with him and the, uh, and the bat right now, but yeah, you know, like at some point, if he's not hitting and, and the, and the playoffs continue to happen, they won't do this because they've, they've, they've played him every single day, but you know, Oswaldo Cabrera will come in on a, in a, in a moment yeah, when, no he, chance. When, when he <laughs> doesn't no play chance. for a week and comes in, what did he go? Two for four yesterday. Like numbers are very similar across the, uh, uh, across the, um, as far as OPS with the, those two players, but you know, one sample size is much larger than the other sample size. So he walked on Saturday's game and he had not had a walk since April 30th. So he went April 30th. That can't be right. Yep. Oh, April? sorry. August, 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 <laughs> August, August 30th. He went August 30th to September 13th without a walk. And before that he had not walked since August 22nd. So it, it, he goes, 10, 12, 14 games in between walks. He strikes out twice a night. He does weird things like trying to bunt with two outs for a base hit with a guy on second base. It's just, like you said, he's grasping at straws instead of just focusing on one thing, being pitch selective and swing a group. I believe the talent is there for him to be a positive offensive player. We've seen it, okay? You don't just have... Fla- you can't have flashes without actually like having the potential, right? And he's had yeah. enough flashes where you you see it. But he can't be a, a 90 OPS player and just play good defense. That's not good enough out of your top prospect that you anointed as your sh- starting shortstop, everyday shortstop, passing over other free agents. You've got to get better offense out of him. He's not. It's not going to be successful if he's just a sl- even league average. He needs to be positive offensively. This is this is right now. This is what he is right now. This is what he is. None of this is going to get fixed in the middle of the season or at the end of the season. It's not going to. So he could go on a hot streak and see the ball. Maybe he could, he, he could get on the hot streak and see the ball. Well, we know that. when he gets on because when he does get on a hot streak and he's yeah. swinging at everything, at least he's hitting it Very at that good. point. You know, and that's that's really what we're looking for at this point. Um, any of those those like major adjustments are going to have to happen with repetition and and a lot of work uh, so that he trains his eye in a better way. He's able to see the, I don't know, get those Brian Roberts cheating contacts so you can see the the, the white of the ball a little bit better. I don't oh know. God. If we find Figure out this out. is an eyesight thing, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we find out this is something stupid and very easily present pre- uh, preventable by just like the Yankees training staff doing their job, I'm going to be so angry. Like, oh, we didn't, we, the- didn't th- we didn't think to give him an eye test. It's something about the way that the helmet is putting a pressure on like a lobe <laughs> in his brain. And because it flies off, as soon as it flies off, he's like, oh, I'm good. I'm ready to go. They're going to be no, like, oh, I, well, Anthony wears contacts, but he didn't realize he was putting the left eye in the right eye and the right eye in the left eye. And that's why he hasn't been able to hit the ball. But I mean, look, I, I've been defending him all year long. It's difficult to defend when you see the numbers. But at the same time, uh, the the guy's got what it, what he what he needs to be successful it's a matter of getting better he needs to improve on certain very very clear areas of his game he needs to improve because like you said the talent is there the athleticism is there a lot of the things are there and when he gets hot he's really good really good and and you can see it there's a lot of confidence oozing from him so but that's again, just also that's also a bad decision a, like even if you just swung at three pitches at least like you're doing the right thing in that spot which is trying to get a base hit it's not bunting in that spot so he also it's not just about yes he needs to improve he also needs to be smarter in that situation that's not what he did is not helping the team at all well i i think that's what he believes he thinks he is helping the team by trying to pass the baton in the best way that he can and that's by bunting to get on base at that point well that's that's not, that's, not that's where the that's where the um the mindset comes from and like the mentality around that most likely that's not great. Doing anything I can to get on the base. All right. Today we are presented also by Navage Nasal Care. If there's one thing we all agree on is that congestion is the absolute worst. Maybe you have a cold or just allergies, whatever it is. Congestion is a pain because it affects your sleep, your breathing, and makes it hard to focus and generally just puts you in a bad mood. I have a great product to tell you about. If you are suffering from congestion, it's called Navage Nasal Care. Navage makes breathing easy, easier. Navage uses smooth saline flow and gentle patented nasal suction to clear nasal passages. Navage is drug-free and uses 99.9% pure saline salt pods with no medicinal side effects. It's very easy to use. You hold it up to your nose, you press start, boom, it can work in as fast as 30 seconds. I've got two young children in daycare. Like I said, I've got to take Lucy to to the doctor in, in 20 minutes, actually. 
because there's just always sicknesses going around daycare. So having this at home, just clear out my nasal passages once or twice a week has been absolutely clutch. I love the product and I know you will too. Right now, our listeners can order a convenient Navage starter pack, including a nose cleaner with batteries and 30 original salt pods. Plus you get a cleaning kit as a free gift with your order by going to navage.com slash Bronx and use promo code Bronx, navage.com slash Bronx, promo code Bronx for the starter pack plus free cleaning kit. Navage is spelled N-A-V-A-G-E, navage.com slash Bronx, promo code Bronx. We are also brought to you by Babbel. One in five people have learned a new language on their bucket list. If you're not one of those five people, I don't know what you're doing. Put but it on your bucket list. Put it on your bucket list. Babbel gets you talking in another language because their courses are designed by real people for real conversations. Their lessons are quick, just 10 minutes long, so you don't get overwhelmed with information. The courses are handcrafted by over 200 language experts, ready to get you talking your new language in as little as three weeks. So think, think about that. By the time the Yankees are playing in the playoffs, you could be speaking in another language. October baseball's here. You could watch in Spanish. You could turn on the SAP broadcast because you understand it from Babbel. Babbel also has a cool feature called speech recognition technology, which helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. Again, everything Babbel is going to teach you is for talking like a local in the new language. And I think that's pretty awesome and useful if you've got a trip coming up. With over 16 million subscriptions sold, Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by a 20-day money-back guarantee. So there's no pressure. Special offer for our listeners right now. Get 60% off your Babbel subscription at babbel.com slash Bronx. 60% off at babbel.com slash Bronx. Babbel is spelled B-A-B-B-E-L. Babbel.com slash Bronx. Rules and restrictions may apply. Anthony Volpe needs to learn a new language in the middle of the season to keep his mind off of things and just go out there and let the talent play. All right, guys. Andrew had to uh, had to jet out. He's got a sick little kid at home taking her to the doctor, so I hope everything goes well there. Uh, before we get out of here, a couple more things we wanted to talk about, um, specifically about Carlos Rodon and uh, and his home versus road split. So I got Logan still with me. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about this. Look, yesterday you're looking at what um, – what he was doing on the mound. And like the first thing I think of when I see the the final stat line is like, I need, I still need you to get deeper into games. Like that was the number one thing that, that um, I'm looking at. And I know he was pulled with 88 pitches. So his pitch count going into the sixth inning actually was pretty, pretty decent. Or I think even in the, in the, in the fifth, he was at like 60 some pitches and then it, it kind of got away. Um, and, and then he gave up that home run and obviously Boone um, took the ball from him, but, no depth there. His ro- home and road splits are really interesting. And the way that this is lining up for the Yankees, obviously the division is what they are shooting for. And I think that they need to go just full out for that division because it gives them control in how they can line guys up for the playoffs with on the pitching side. And clearly that makes a difference. So Logan, if you want to throw out his, uh, his home road splits right here, and we can talk about that quickly. Yeah. So for whatever reason, he's actually made uh, four more starts on the road. But in his 13 home starts, he's 9-2 and two with a 3.09 ERA. And then on the road, he's 6-7 and seven in 17 starts with a 5.01 ERA. So, I mean, two runs, you know, two earned runs per nine higher than um, uh, at home, which I didn't realize that it was so stark yeah. until before yesterday's game. And then the numbers didn't change all that much from yesterday's game. Um, but he's pretty still, consistent with what he gets. He's, he's getting yeah. in, He's getting into the sixth inning, whether he closes it out or not. Uh, and, and yeah, he's given up a, a few home runs it, or it seems like one home run that he's given up almost, uh, each time that, that really does affect how the line looks at the end. Yeah. I mean, he just, he sometimes when he's good, he kind of has that like one mistake. And a lot of times it's even a solo shot where it's right. like, he, he gets out of there and it's like 5.2, one and run one home run. And he threw 97 pitches. It's like, and, one okay. thing that that Andrew was uh, was was standing on the table about before this week, and we he, I think he said an over under of thirteen and a half. I think it was thirteen and a half stolen bases for yeah, that's the Kansas said. City and the Boston series. Ended up at ten, so I hammered the low, won that bet, which is uh, is good. And I think it's to the credit again, like they did a decent job keeping guys off the base path for the most part. That was the number one thing. Like the pitching did a good job. Um, but for Rodon specifically, people are just running. I know it, that Trevino, it looks like he can't throw people out, but they're stealing the bag on Carlos Rodon at that point. Um, he's 
he's too slow to the to the play. And I just don't think he cares at this point. And I think he's just trying to focus on the batter. Uh, and you know, to his credit, he got out of the inning after um, the you know two stolen bases, stole second, stole third. Uh, Trevino really didn't have much of a chance, and he's trying to rush a throw. The, the throw down to second base looked bad, but again, he's trying to rush it because there's a huge jump uh, from from uh, from him being held on. So. And part of the problem is is that neither of these catchers, I mean, Wells is a little better than Trevino, but neither of these catchers is a catcher that could kind of make up for that. Right. With there's players, no cannons. You know? you know, there's no Gary Sanchez coming out there and, you know, ripping it down to second base when he really shouldn't have had a chance. So yeah. you kind of... Wells had some good throws lately, though. He does. Honestly, no. Like he's, he's, his, his arm is strong enough. It's a matter of... And I think he's just going to continue to get better with his pop time and, like, release time. Um, because I do think his arm is strong enough and, and it's, it's relatively accurate, but you know, he's, he's definitely, I think he's getting better at that. And I think by next year, you're going to see a much, much more improved Austin Wells, you know, controlling the, the base runners. He's been great on, in all of the aspects and he's only getting better. And I remember watching him in spring training thinking like, this could be a real, you know, he could be a real difference maker. You know, when you have a catcher that could hit like that and whatever, I still think that 10 stolen bases in seven games and three caught stealings. That feels like a lot still, no? It's still, yeah, but the way that you looked at, the way that those happened, uh, pinch runner from Kansas City came in, stole two bags, and then you saw a dude from um, from Boston come in to steal two. So really, four of those, actually five, I think there was another one um, in Kansas City from that same dude. I think there were five total by two people who who, yeah. who can who can run. So yeah, it's, it's probably too many, but at the same time, it's, um, I think for the most part, they just, they kept guys off the base path because honestly, if there were more, if there was more traffic on the base path, if there were, if the pitchers gave up more hits and, and, and ha- had more base runners, I think we would have seen um, something different, but there were what three caught stealing. There was a, a pickoff in the Kansas city um, in the Kansas city series as well. So f- they were definitely paying more attention. It was definitely a thing. They were trying to be more, uh, you know, more, you know, controlling of, of what was happening on the base path. So the, the pitcher conversation is interesting with, with, and the splits for, for Rodon, this is just a good way for us to quickly talk about how the playoffs are kind of lining up right now. And obviously the Yankees are trying to win the division. That is their clearest path to um, the playoffs right now, clearest path to having control of the playoffs, obviously, because if they, they would have the number one seed with the best record, um, but that lines them up at home and, Obviously, Rodon is a better pitcher at home. He is, uh, the, the numbers are very clear in saying that. So you got Garrett Cole and Carlos Rodon one and two. I mean, it's, I don't think it's that difficult. That's something that we've been saying is going to happen no matter what. Andrew was like, ah, don't, you know, with Rodon. But I think the Yankees have always been of the mindset that he's going to be the number two guy. And I think he's just pitching better now that, that helps warrant that, that decision and makes it justifies, uh, you know, why. And plus the splits, like, the, the justification is there for sure. Yeah, and as dumb as it sounds, when Cole went down on opening day, they didn't say, Rodon, you're going one. They kept him second game of the season. Like right. He's in their mind. That's what he is. That's what he's paid to be. And sometimes when the Yankees have a feeling like that, they don't really, you know, they're not fluid. They don't change it. They're just going to stick to it as, unless they have overwhelming, you know, that they Conviction have Conviction and it. evidence and why they have right. to do something. And, and at exactly. one point... With Nestor, while he was still in the conversation for being a starter, and maybe he's still in the conversation. I don't think it's totally dead yet, but uh, him being um, a, a starter, you know, a month and a half ago, two, maybe it was more like two months ago, when you saw his splits, his splits were completely lopsided for home and away. Okay. They had since come back to earth a little bit and, and, you know, I think fell, you know, much closer to the mean on both sides. Um, but Rodon is the, is the clear one. And that would, that would then mean Luis Heel, I would think, or Clark Schmidt, depending on how you're doing it in the matchup, and probably depending on what's, uh, you know, what's going on for those first two games, would line up for that first game um, on the road and, and be able to, uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's a really good, I think that that's an interesting one because now you have the ability to dominate game one on the road if he's at, uh, you know, if he's pitching at, to, to his abilities at that point. You know, I'm just looking at, the schedule because they do you know that baseball does some weird stuff i mean so they play they would play in a division series game one and then have an off day and then play game two yeah remember they were doing this stuff and i think they play seven it looks like they would play the seventh and then the ninth so that would be another off day so they could do like it, it allows them they to have get options funky which we have to we have to look at that because if they really have 
two off days in between the two first games and five days off before the like that's not good like that's you know too much rest in you know terms but they'll they'll get funky with it and they'll start making you know guys will be available and they won't announce starters and if they want right. to use you know Clark Schmidt in high leverage in game two they'll do it and then because of the call, off days and that's it and that right because and then they'll say he's going to start game three and then Schmidt would you know have a day like they'll do some They'll end up. I don't want them to do that. To, to Andrew's point, let's let's uh, let's just find some lanes here. And I, 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 I keep agree. using the word lane because they keep using it, and it's it's starting to bother me. Even though I used to use it, even before Cashman would talk about this, so he's ruining the word for me, which is not I don't appreciate. Um, but yeah, I, you know, some relative consistency would I think be good for this team. Um, all right. So before we talk about this road trip, any other news and notes? Looks like DJ Lemayhew received a cortisone injection. So maybe, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's totally phantom, but you know, maybe, maybe they were leaning. They, they, they took a, a, a more precautionary route with him and said that they're not putting it out of the question that he could be back. I don't see that happening. I don't know they'll where have, he would possibly play. They'll have him kind of, you know, with a group of other guys in Tampa continuing to ramp up through the playoffs. You know, yeah. God if an injury were to went, occur, right. and he would Just be so ready that they to have be bodies, and and you know, you know, you'd still even hurt and all the bad stuff about DJ. You might still rather him than some of the other options that they would have. Yeah. In a pinch. no, that's a good point. I think keep, keeping him ready. If there's a, an ability to keep him ready, if that is a, a help, and and to keep him as a warm body uh, that could come in and and potentially do something, then that's that sounds like a good place for for him. And then, uh, you know, we alluded to uh, the the pitching. And the bullpen potentially changing. I still think that there's there's going to be room over the next you know two weeks here of uh, of of competition in that pen. And honestly, you know what we've we've seen ever since they've moved Clay Holmes from that ninth inning role, we've seen that competition pick uh, tick up. And and it's like because of that, they were forced into some accountability. It took them forever. It took them way too long, and they were forced into some accountability. And because of that accountability, you saw competition, and guys are actually pitching better. They're stepping up in a competition, and you know, who knows? Like internally, maybe there's, maybe they got some side bets. Maybe they got some some internal competitions going on for who who can take that that ball in the ninth inning. But clearly, guys are responding. Uh, Cody Petit is uh, really close to the returning to the big leagues. That's another guy who can give you length if needed. Um, so he's an interesting. He's an interesting piece. He's not a, a def, you know, he doesn't have a definite starting role and a, he does not have a definite bullpen role either. He's a, he's a swing guy. Um, so he's interesting. And then Lou Trevino, uh, have, as they say, has quote unquote, been building a lot of good momentum over the last month. Brubaker rehabbing, uh, starting in AAA too. So there are names. If you see some really, if they see some really good things from these guys uh, and they have the ability to help, then there, there could be um, another you know, a couple names switching out potentially in, in the bullpen. So I, again, bring on more competition because that's what they need. They need more dudes throwing. And if someone gets hot, then all, all four getting them into the games. Don't be shocked though. If this, you know, bullpen that we have right now, the names in here outside of Mark Leiter Jr. Cause they would have to pull somebody from this roster. Cause the rosters go down a spot or two in the playoffs yeah. um, is the bullpen in the playoffs. Like even Tim Mesa, who's like the last guy in the bullpen through, had three and two thirds scoreless, and you would think that they would send him down or make room for a new body before Sunday's game, and they kept him, which leads you to believe that he they believe he's a part of this team. They believe that they want him to be around. I don't he's know if I necessarily lefty. believe that he they believe that. I think that they, they because of Kane Lee's reverse want, splits want that. Uh, I think that maybe some of these guys were not ready to to come up yet. Potentially, I, I look. I don't know what they're doing maybe. with the bullpen. I think I still they're trying to throw shit at the wall. I. I can't see him getting into a playoff game. Close, you know what? It's going to be close. You know, it's because when you, you know, Weaver, Canely, Cousins, Holmes, Hill, Hamilton, the starters, they're going to be, you know. It's going to be close. So and when you that's see. That's going to be, those guys are going to be there though. Lighter can't be on the roster. You can't have him out there. There's, there's, he has literally shown nothing to, to, to say that he could be an effective pitcher especially in a high leverage situation in the playoffs. The guy's going to give up a home run. That's what he does. That's what he's done since he's gotten here. You cannot have him there. So yeah, I think there's potentially two spots uh, that could change. And then they're making decisions based on what they're doing with the starters at that point. But Trevino wouldn't surprise me. Brubaker, they've been, I feel like they've been just like getting him ready for this moment and this moment alone. Cause I, they, they acquired him. He was, he was uh, an injured player at the time. And, and now he's, they're seeing what they can get right before the end of the season. So 
wouldn't surprise me if they like what they see from him. He's got a live arm, obviously uh, well rested, uh, and and he's able to to come in there. Would not surprise me if we saw uh, him up there. And then Lou Trevino also wouldn't surprise me to be honest. And I, then you got the Efros thing too, which was just, I I think Efros. It doesn't feel like they trust him. That that's what it feels I like. I totally to me. agree. It feels like they don't trust them at all. I, uh, I agree. They they sent him down so fast. Um, it doesn't seem like he's gonna be gonna be up. I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like they trust him at all right now. So, um, yeah, it's strange. All right. Well, uh, so the last thing, uh, Mariners, the Yankees are going on the road. Uh, you got the Mariners coming up. They are, I guess they're 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 still fighting for that wild card spot. They're two and a half games uh, back in the wild card. I think they're right there with Detroit. When you look at the wild card standings and you see the Detroit Tigers still at two and a half games back, that's crazy. Um, Obviously, right now, there's three AL Central teams in there. If the Tigers were to take it, then still three, because uh, one of those would be would be out. Um, but the Mariners, you know, maybe they still feel like they have a, a shot. Do they do they have any games left with the with the Astros? Because I think they're four and a half games out in the West, if you could check that. But um, sure. Heel versus Brian Wu, uh, Cortez versus Bryce Miller. And uh, Clark Schmidt versus Logan Gilbert. They got some good pitching, so it's these are not going to be easy games. These are going to be tough outings for the Yankees. Uh, they're going guys. for. I mean, they they do actually have three games left with Houston. Okay, um, so they're. I mean, they got to win. Like they're going to be coming out and and doing everything they possibly can to win these games because they have to put themselves in a position to overtake Houston. Is that the second to last series or last series? Second to last, uh, <clears throat> I believe. So they got to put themselves in a position to uh, to obviously. Um, be within striking distance when they're playing the uh, the Astros. So and they're still, not I mean, out of it. We've you know, seen crazy things out of a wild card. You know, also um, the Orioles actually do. You know, talking up piggybacking off that have a tough schedule too. So you yeah. know, the Yankees go on the West Coast. They do have three at Oakland after these three in Seattle. So that's you got to take care of business there. But these games are going to be tough. Three good yeah, starts. West Coast that, trip late in the season. Yeah, that I, that's never an easy. That's never an easy trip uh, at this point. So. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining uh, again. And um, we got uh, we got the series as a late one, so um, you know, cheers to you staying up uh, watching these uh, these ten o'clock games as we're as we're wrapping the season. It's kind of a a late West Coast trip. It's kind of a dick move for a fan base, to be honest. But um, we'll talk to you guys after that series. Have a good one.